This is the Open University. Hey, hey, hi, hey. Uh, hello. <laughs> hello again to the Open University. It's been a while. I've been out at the Sunday market today buying some um, Lieder and Chanson stuff. This is actually very good Hanna Vida. Um, this is on the uh, Elite label. The other two records I got are on the um, Amiga label, which was the, the old DDR, East German, communist era label. This is Gisela May sings Eric Kessner songs. Um, oh, sorry, no, that's, that's not, that's actually somebody else. That's Gisela May. And um, that's also very good. It's a very Brettian, very Brett file. Um, and... Um, this guy I haven't listened to yet. I really liked his sleeve, though. He's called Otto Reuter, uh, born in 1870. And um, these records were one euro each down at the market on the Maibel Hoover. Um, this, is, uh, this was two euros in its um, Bibliotex or Camp, which I have a sort of fetish about. Um, poems by Giuseppe Ungaretti, who was an Italian poet of the early 20th century. And it's a parallel edition of... Um, Italian on the left side and German on the right. Uh, my Italian and my German are kind of on par with each other in terms of <laughs> their inadequacy. So um, it's actually quite interesting to see if, if, if the um, gaps in my knowledge match. So on, uh, I might not know one word in Italian, which I do know in German, or vice versa. So you, that way you can patch together some kind of competence or... or or incompetence, I don't know. Um, I'd, uh, another book I've got, which is kind of like that, is um, by a Dutch poet called Sis Noteboom, and it's, um, it's in the Einaudi poetry series, which is another of my fetish series, and um, it's, uh, it, it's Dutch on one side and Italian on the other. And Dutch, I really don't speak any Dutch at all, but because Dutch is so close to English, it's actually quite easy to guess, to guess what people are saying. So what have you been up to, Marmus? Um, in the time since I last spoke to you, I've been traveling quite a lot. And I told you in the last video that I was in Scotland, seeing my mum and doing some events for the, uh, the Book of Scotland, which I've got here in my, the little Momus section here, which is ever-expanding as I shift more from records to books. I well, still make records. Got a record out last week or something as well. This is the new edition of the Book of Scotland, which has got a lot more empty space in it than the last one. You can actually draw little pictures on the pages of this for each Scotland. That's the idea anyway. Um, to make you, the reader, more creative. And um, so, yeah, I've um, got a new, new book I collaborated with Hagen Verleger on. <laughs> Hagen, Hagen, my graphic designer who did the cover of that and several of my recent records, has, um, has been doing this project, Mar Margaret van Eyck, um, renaming an institution um, and I've done some fake contributors notes for the people in this volume. Um, let's see one of them at random. Um, they run alongside and, and sometimes mine are on the right and uh, the real biography is on the left. So um, here's someone called Sachi Miachi, born 1990 in Amsterdam, whereas on the other side of the page it says she's born in 1978 in Tokyo uh, and on, on <laughs> on my side, the fake biography, it says she runs a hardware store in the Zoshigaya district of Tokyo, but she runs it as art. And it says that she's um, currently concerned with commoning initiatives as a means to generate more inclusive social spaces in our cities, and also with the new Makita BHX 2500CA four-stroke leaf blower, which is a bit noisy but does an amazing job at shifting autumn leaves from your doorstep, and is on special offer at just 18,000 yen. Whereas the real Sachi, um, she's, um, her work consists mainly of three-dimensional installations, site-specific interventions, performances and drawings, etc., etc. So it's not too hard to work out which is which, I think. But um, kind of fake, uh, fake biographies and, and uh, parallel worlds, that's what I specialize in. I'm not going to say any more about the, the autobiography, the memoir I'm writing, which is still provisionally entitled Drugs. I've kind of come back round to that title, although it's not so much about drugs as it was. But I'm about 11,000 words into that now, out of this projected 75. So it looks like it's going to 
end ahead of schedule. It's going to be finished um, in in the winter rather than the spring or the summer of next year. But let's see. Um, I got the advance, I got the first tranche, tranche of the advance from New York for that and immediately got in trouble with my bank because they think I'm a money launderer now. They can't, they have so little confidence in me. They don't believe that I'm capable of earning the <laughs> sums of money which are starting to arrive in my account. And um, they just don't think I'm worth it. So they've called me in for a talk. Uh, you know, are you selling drugs? Are you an international, you know, gangster? Um, I'm going to have to persuade them that I'm legit. I'm really worth it. I'm really worth that money. And um, otherwise, they're going to close my account, they say. That's a friendly gesture, isn't it? You get in trouble for not having enough money, and you get in trouble for having too much. Bloody hell. So um, what have I done, and where have I been? I'm going to lean on Franz Kafka here as I tell you my adventures and my travels. I've been in Italy. I went to Bologna via Venezia. So I was at the art fair, which is called the Venice Biennale. Uh, but this year it's the Architecture Biennale. And architecture and design are um, something I find inherently optimistic. So I like to go to those, even although visually they might not be as interesting as the art biennial, because um, there's a bit less of an open brief. You know, artists can do whatever they want. According to me, anyway, some people say they should just represent scenes which look realistic. But um, those are the Brexit Brexiters. <laughs> they just did a, they published a survey last week which said that uh, um, Brexiters have a strong preference for realistic art over abstraction, or presumably over conceptual art as well, although they didn't even consider conceptual art. I'm sure there'd be even a more strong negative correlation between conceptual art and support of Brexit. But um, unfortunately, it just sort of confirmed, the study confirmed, that first of all, um, Brexit is not rationally amenable. Uh, in other words, you're not going to worry about economic arguments if it's really a culture wars thing. I think it is basically a, a culture wars thing that the kind of people who say, my three-year-old could do that when they look at a, a Rothko are also the kind of people who say the EU is rubbish and don't let you eat bendy bananas, you know. But also, it's, um, it correlates with the findings that people who support Brexit are um, educationally not as advanced as people who don't support it. So it's, it's all about educational attainment. And while the figures are better, when I went to university, only, I don't know, less than 10% of the British population went to university, so we were a very small minority, we graduates. But... Um, now I think they've got it up to closer to 40 or 50 percent, I believe. I, I, I should check those figures. So you'd, you'd expect there to be, I mean, it was, it was a 50-50 kind of thing, the Brexit referendum. So, um, but there were, if you look at newspaper consumption, the newspapers that sell, you know, 80 percent of newspapers sold in Britain are sold with a right-wing perspective. Partly because of ownership patterns, but also because the English, there are a lot of English compared with us Scots, Welsh or Irish. Just numerically, there are more of them, and they're more conservative than we are. So um, that presents us with problems, you know. Um, anyway, Brexit, bloody hell. Why am I talking about Brexit? Yeah, I was talking about Italy. Um, I was in Venice, and the Arsenale show... I, have to, I, I was staying in this fantastic hotel, first of all. It had beautiful... Uh, what do you call those sort of nougat-looking polished marble, speckled floors they have in Italy? It had that, those kind of floors that every building has in Italy, basically. But then with this wonderful molded, coloured plastic furniture on it and um, posters from conceptual art installations in the 70s. I think the guy who ran the hotel had been an artist or something in, in the 70s. That was the impression I got. And he was... Um, he had decorated the rooms in about 1972, which for me is a bit of a peak year in terms of... That's when there were more liberals, you know? There was more than... 10% liberal. You know, there was a kind of liberal swell in the whole of society in the late 60s and early 70s. This is the period I've got up to in my memoir as well, the sort of wonderful age of the little red school book and all the rest of it, when Danish educators were splashing across the headlines. Of course, everything worthwhile was being banned. Hair, the rock opera, the little red school book, uh, all that stuff was predictably being banned in Britain or bowdlerized, and the British did publish that book, but they published a severely restricted version of it. Um, so, but still, yeah, 1972. Anyway, yes, my hotel was a bit 72-ish. And then the Arsenal uh, show was kind of boring because architecture is really just people presenting plans and models of... And also there was a sort of corporate 
feeling of a lot of companies sort of greenwashing or, or talking about um, fair trade or, or, you know, trying to give themselves a good image and saying they were so excited about their projects and how they were visualizing the future. The Giardini, which is the National Pavilions, was much more interesting. And my favorite installation there was the Korean Pavilion, which had a, a thing about what does it mean to be avant-garde in the 21st century and how was the um, future visualized by trade fairs and expos in the 20th century. So it looks back over 50 years of all sorts of trade events, forward-looking progressive trade events um, like the Expo 70 in Osaka. It's both Korean and Japanese trade events and futuristic fairs and things like that. Of course, Britain has just been... <laughs> Yippee, we've been promised a fair of our own, a festival of Brexit Britain in 2022 by Theresa May. <laughs> I'm so delighted about that. I'm not, I'm obviously not. I did mention the original festival of Britain um, in my memoir recently because it did set a tone in 1951 of optimism about the, the post-war period of Britain and it went together with the Labour governments in the post-war period, um, giving us wonderful new social contract, um, you know, provision of uh, healthcare free, provision of unemployment and um, all sorts of public institutions, the BBC, the Open University, all sorts of things came along in that period, um, Keynesian things which are now being picked off one by one and privatised, um, I mean all my adult life they've been in a process of being privatised. So it's all, again, it's a story of things going to hell <laughs> and Brexit, Brexit, um, the poster, actually, which um, uh, Richard, Dr. Richard Littler, who does this Garfolk uh, graphic design satire thing, um, he, he did a, a, a take on the original Festival of Britain poster in which Britannia is actually shooting herself in the head, bullet going through, you know. This is, uh, this is how the world ends, not with a whim but a banker, not even with a banker. Because the Financial Times is actually a voice of reason these days. It's actually with a, with a whimper, with a sort of a whinnying, um, patriotic, Enoch Paulian whimper. Anyway, yes, so where was I in Italy? Oh, yeah, I was just in Venice. Yeah, I had a, a, a pretty whirlwind visit, but I, I did enjoy uh, Korea and some of the, you know, the Netherlands, Spain, um, Switzerland, the Scandinavian pavilions, you know, they were all... Sort of diverting um, installations in those Giardini pavilions. And then the next day I took the train down to Bologna, which is a couple of hours down the train tracks, and did this um, poetry event. I sang as the culminating event in, in, in a poetry conference, which was organized by an artist called Karen Sitter, who was incidentally also the person who invited me to Paris, where I went the following weekend to perform at the Museum of um, Judaic History in Le Marais on the Rue du Temple. And these are probably the only two Mama shows I'm doing this year, so that was your chance, it's gone. And um, I didn't really publicize them. Um, I, I kind of like the fact that these, if your fee is not affected by the number of people who come, I mean, screw the number of people who come, I don't care. But I also like the fact that it's not Mama's fans, if there are such things in Paris these days. It's, it's kind of regular members of the public who are doing the Nuit Blanche or who come into that museum because it's their favorite or local museum, whatever. And then they don't know who the hell you are. And you start with a song like Space Jews, which I did in the Jewish Museum. And um, they, um, I think I changed a couple of lyrics, actually. I changed a lyric at the end, which goes, I really admire them. I really want to be like them. I changed it to, I want to admire them. I want, really want to be like them. Um, I want to want to be like them. So I think it's, um, there's a little more um, ironic distance in that song now than there used to be. Uh, what else has been going on? I, I had a nice weekend in Paris uh, meet, uh, seeing my friends Jill and Flo who are moving from the uh, 11th arrondissement to the 13th quite soon down to the Vietnamese area. Um, I hung out with my girlfriend who's the Vietnamese Parisian garments dealer mentioned in the Brexit Chasm song. And um, I've also, since I got back to Berlin, I've been seeing just, just a, a light social calendar. I've been seeing uh, friends like Jan Lindenberg, who rents this flat to me, and um, was demonstrating the cold weather tactics necessary to build log fires and coal fires, like the ceramic fire in the next room. It's actually really terrifying to me, because not only do your hands get dirty and you have to 
pump bottle <laughs> buckets of coal up and down the stairs from the cellar. But you um, risk alienating the neighbours, as I did the other day when I was testing the ceramic coal fire. And I was doing it in warm weather because it's like 25 degrees every day to these, these days. So um, I didn't realise that the air pressure actually holds the smoke down in the chimney when you do that. And then um, you have any cracks in the, in the ceramics or in the stove, you know, the, the smoke starts seeping out bringing its carbon monoxide with it and you know so the neighbors upstairs this happened to them as well i think the chimney is actually blocked and really needs to be chimney swept by the la the landlord's expense before we can actually start the hot um the the, um, the fossil fuel burning season so i didn't really realize that and, and i smoked them out a bit and they came down <laughs> sort of furious and alarmed at their their flat filling up with smoke understandably so um that was that was a bit of a drama um, I also saw Jessine Hein, um, who's an artist, a German artist, but she's got a terribly American accent, and um, she's now moved to a new new flat near the Admiralsbrücke, which is a very desirable part of Kreuzberg, and she had uh, this um, painting which she made of me a couple of years ago, which um, she now stores in a, a sort of dark room, and she's kind of given up on painting temporarily as she moves more into, you know, experimenting with music and stuff. And she went up and she tried to join the art college and she was there for one day and, and didn't like the atmosphere, the Udeka here in Berlin, didn't like it and then quit again. So she's a bit kind of fluctuating in her, her art career just now. But, so there aren't many paintings in this dark room. There's just this one painting of me which she did without an eye patch on. So it looks like you can sort of see my id or my, my Mr. Hyde. I always think this covered eye, it's like my, my Freudian id, my Mr. Hyde kind of Ugly, the ugly and violent side of me is kind of hiding behind the eye patch, and so there it was revealed. She she worked on a photograph of me she'd taken without the eye patch. It's there in her dark room, like an attic, you know, like Dorian Gray in his um, his locked attic. The the painting getting more and more wrinkled and ugly as Dorian acts beautifully, but uh, but not morally beautifully out in the world. So I kind of got the impression I was seeing this picture of Dorian. Um, of myself as Dorian, um, getting more and more ugly while I, while I stay young and beautiful out here in the world. Um, and who else have I seen? I saw Tomoko Miyata, Tomoko Sauvage, as she calls herself, who's making music with water bowls and things. She's on tour just now. She came by and I had one of my eye headaches, again the eye, again with the eye. I, I was basically zonked flat on my beanbag, uh, having to just, I couldn't even move. I get into these vicious circles where I, the only way to get out of an eye strain headache, it's, it's kind of caused by pressure or, or lack of nutrition. So the eye, which is already very soft, this bad eye, it gets even softer in low pressure or low, you know, low nutrition sort of situations. And then I um, have to eat to basically pump it up again. But I'm nauseous and feverish, so I can't eat. The idea of food nauseates me even further. So... The only thing I can do is actually eat white rice, plain white rice. I can't even think of eating anything savory on top of it. Um, so Tomoko, poor Tomoko, had to go down to the Korean, local Korean restaurant and get herself some dinner while I just cooked. I prepared some rice for myself. and uh, So it wasn't much fun that night, but I've recovered. It's kind of like a period. I get that once a month and then uh, it goes away and I'm better again. So anyway, yeah, um, <laughs> I think that's my news. That's pretty much all, all my news. Um, just been uh, enjoying this beautiful German um, autumn. It's a kind of Indian summer because it's it's still pretty hot. You can still wear flip flops and t-shirts and things out there. Um, and um, getting on with my book, I tend to write um, one or two little sections, paragraphs every every day, and I've got a sort of selection here. I sort of sit here. I've got bought a new lamp the other day, and I sit here um, with a selection on my trestle table of books from my library, like, like everybody with a fairly extensive library, I've only read about 10% of it or 20% of it. And that's, um, what do you call it, sundoku. Uh, sundoku is the Japanese word for having a big stack of books which you plan to get round to reading at some point but haven't yet done. Um, so this is um, my sort of shelves of sundoku. And... Um, I take books out and think this would be interesting to read, and I read it. I graze in them. I, I read par pages and paragraphs here and there, and I sort of extract. Usually, I get an idea while reading. I think a lot of writing is interstitial in that you're often um, 
writing in between the lines of other writers, referring to other writers a lot, pastiching other writers, becoming temporarily in a zealot-like way other writers. And then, um, yeah, then you, um, you sort of write as a footnote, as an appendage, as a historical afterthought, and, and then it turns into literature, and literature is just this big meshed um, spider's web of, of writers talking to other writers. Is that, does that make sense, a, spy, a meshed spider web of writers? <laughs> it's not a very good metaphor. Um, but, but yeah, so I, that's a, sort of da- a daily selection might be laid out on that table. And uh, what have I got there? Psychopathia Sexualis by Kraft Ebbing. I've got Vittor Gombrowicz's journal. I've got a book about, um, uh, it's a book in French about uh, antique Greece called Les Grands Sanctuaires de la Grèce Antique, which uh, really lays on something I've noticed and feel very strongly, which is that Christianity stole all the best, uh, all the pre Christian festivals, if they, they either suppressed them and called them satanic, you know, all the names of Satan, Beelzebub and all the rest of it are just the names of genuine alternative religion gods' names. Um, or Christianity, if it couldn't squash a festival, like the Spring Festival, it would actually integrate it and say it was something to do with Christ. I mean, there were, there were festivals to Mithras or whoever on the 25th of December, which Christianity couldn't sufficiently squash, and so they said, oh, that's the date that Christ was born, actually. And they tried to integrate it into their own calendar and then sort of, in that way, simply swallow up all the, um, the pagan festivals that we, that we had, we non-Christians had before Christianity came along. So in that sense, a very imperialistic religion and a very um, bullying religion, unlike, say, Shinto, which is not an evangelical religion, which is the Japanese folk and nature religion. And, and even Buddhism in Japan coexists very happily with Shintoism, something we've not achieved in the West, because we, we tend to, just like we have a first-past-the-post electoral system in Britain, we have a first-past-the-post religious system where, where Christianity gets first-past-the-post and then knocks everybody else out. Um, that's probably a good place to end this talk. This has been the Open University. Um, I, I don't know what, with what frequency I'll be doing these things in the future because um, I'm writing, but, you know, Talking and writing, they're not mutually exclusive. Open University.